The honor and pleasure, of course, is all mine. Thank you for the introductory remarks, uh, Joka. I, uh, I kind of gleaned a little bit of what you said, and it's always just too much. Uh, I was here three years ago, and it's a great uh, opportunity that graduate studies and uh, Professor Nobrega have provided me to return. And I, I think it would be impossible to say that there's another place where the hospitality that is given to, to a visitor could be um, greater than what it is here. Uh, everybody has just been, been wonderful. Thank you all for coming at the end of uh, probably what's been a long day for you. Um, I'm going to make it longer, so I hope you don't find it too boring. I struggled with the content of this lecture for a long time, and I have to say I'm still not happy with it. So I, I hope you get something out of it. It's not any real science, it's just a look back over the last three decades of what has happened in atomic spectroscopy, analytical atomic spectroscopy, particularly for inorganic um, analysis. So uh, let's start with this. This is a, a basic picture of uh, what spectroscopy is in terms of uh, uh, the domains of, uh, of, of uh, activities that there are. And this is not peculiar to inorganic. Of course, we can have the same kind of diagram for organic. I presented these domains here, the three principal ones in the form of a, a Venn diagram, because there is an overlap in the activity. Instrumental analysis, sample preparation, and sample introduction. Certainly, uh, you can see how they overlap. Uh, if you have a particular instrument in your laboratory, this may dictate to you a particular form of sample introduction, and you may only have one. That will mean you may have to undertake a particular form of sample preparation. Or if you have a particular sample preparation technique available, you may have to tailor the nature of the sample introduction to match with your instrument. So what I want to do is look at developments here in instrumental analysis, primarily focusing on mass spectrometry over the last 30 years. Look at sample preparation techniques and what comes to mind here, I think, from the point of view of inorganic chemistry is the introduction of the uh, microwave oven to our kitchens in the 1970s, and then it made the transition to laboratories in the 1980s, so we have uh, advanced digestion procedures. In the, re in the area of sample introduction, uh, I'd like to return to some work that we do specifically in our laboratory uh, aimed with vapor generation, and I'll, I'll show you the connection to that a little later. When I thought about these timelines and advances that are made or milestones in uh, inorganic uh, spectrometry over the years, I was reminded of this cover page that was produced for an issue of Jazz in 2007 by Dave Kopenal, and he traced the evolution of uh, inorganic spectroscopy for the last 150 years, starting with flame emission, thermal ionization, and spark source mass spectrometry, atomic absorption, which is still in use today, but started around 1970, atomic fluorescence, glow discharge, and then we have these ICP sources for optical emission and mass spectrometry. And in Dave's view, he could see the future involving studies of radioisotopes, uh, elemental imaging, I guess, and metalomics. I think a lot of this is becoming true. And the only thing I've added to this uh, cover page is LIBS, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, uh, which, of course, is becoming more widespread recently. And I'd like to look at some of the things that have happened since about 1983, because that's when the first commercial ICP-MS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, was introduced to the commercial market. And I'm proud to say that came from Canada, in fact. In 2004, uh, Jim Weinfordner presented a paper at the Florida Winter Conference wherein he compared several common popular atomic spectroscopic methods, which he termed to be the superstars in this area, to other methodologies, in particular laser-induced breakdown which wasn't tremendously popular back in 2004. So he isolated these three techniques, electrothermal atomization, or graphite furnace atomic absorption, inductively coupled plasma, optical emission, and mass spectrometry, because they were the predominant methods used throughout the world in many different areas for analysis. And he liked to compare the LIBS to that. Well, I think in the intervening years, LIBS has, of course, matured. But what are the milestones that have occurred in all of these areas? So that's going to be the focus of the presentation in regards to instrumental analysis. Now, in focusing on those four instrumental techniques, 
we have to disregard a number of other very important ones, unfortunately, because there's a lack of time. And one of these uh, upcoming is glow discharge, uh, either in a mass spectrometry or in an atomic emission mode. And this is widely used for depth profiling of materials or two-dimensional imaging, where you can get patterns like this, showing the intensities of various elements in a, a multi-element fashion as a function of the 2D geometry of the instrument. Also got not, not going to be able to look at atomic fluorescence, which is widely used for speciation analysis. Here we have detection limits for a number of elements commonly determined by fluorescence. A very simple instrumental technique utilizing perhaps just a hollow cathode lamp as a source, possibly a laser. Detection limits in the parts per trillion range. We're also not going to have a chance to look at cavity ring down spectroscopy, which uh, is a very simple technique. And uh, probably the latest paper, I think in 2005, uh, a group of researchers placed an inductively coupled plasma between two reflecting mirrors, introduced a pulse laser shot through a, a hole in the center, and of course the laser beam would reflect back and forth many thousands of times between these highly reflecting mirrors, providing an absorption path length that was literally kilometers long. And it was estimated through theoretical considerations that the limits of detection with a simple cavity ring down spectroscopy arrangement were competitive with uh, ICPMS. Then there's a whole range of fluorescence techniques from the simple X-ray fluorescence to total, X -ray, total reflection X-ray fluorescence for ultratrace analysis through the synchrotron source uh, varieties such as the X-ray absorption near edge and X-ray absorption fine structure, which provides information on speciation such as the different arsenic forms that you cannot see here, and uh, imaging in general in plants and even rocks. So, Let's begin with LIBS. What are the milestones in LIBS? Rick Russo has summarized uh, some of the activities of laser ablation in analytical chemistry as recently as 2013. And in this application, he reviews uh, fundamentals of laser ablation. Not limited to emission, but also when laser ablation is used in conjunction with ICPMS and ICPOES. Now, typically, a simple LIBS system would use a, a high power pulse laser working either in a nanosecond, femtosecond, infrared, or, or, or deep UV um, to ablate material from the surface of a sample. At the same time, there would be a high intensity plasma generated by that interaction. And from that plasma, one could extract emission intensities from the components of the sample. So with uh, laser, ablation, laser ablation coupled with emission from the plasma in the simplest sense, Limits of detection in the low part per million range are available. No sample preparation is necessary. Solids, liquids, and even gases can be subjected to LIBS. Very small masses are ablated. Very small sizes are needed. A truly multi-element technique is generated. And there's a possibility for remote detection, uh, standoff detection up to 100 meters. But in fact, remote detection even in the extreme can be achieved. And this is an example of a laser ablation unit uh, mounted on the Mars Curiosity rover at the end of their ChemCam. And here we have standoff detection of about three to four meters where this device ablated some sample from what looked like an inclusion in a Martian soil. And of course the information was sent back to the Earth and it was fitted with a camera, um, a detector that had a sensitivity in the range of 240 to 800 nanometers. So this was truly standoff detection all the way from Mars, and it's, I think we would all have to say, this is revolutionary in principle. <coughs> Another revolutionary development in LIBS uh, comes from Rick Russo's laboratory. He has called it Laser Ablation Molecular Isotopic Spectrometry, LAMIS. And it uh, has as its basis the extreme shift in isotopic signature for uh, an element uh, of two isotopes when combined in the form of a molecule as compared with the small shift that occurs in the bare elemental form. 2.5 picometer shift between the emission intensity of boron 10 and <coughs> boron 11 atoms is very difficult to detect with an emission spectrometer because this is getting to be the limit of resolution for modern emission spectrometers. But Almost a nanometer is very easily done as, as seen here. And by fitting the spectrum to a theoretical spectrum, one can obtain information on the relative abundance of the different isotopes. 
And uh, here's another example here for the strontium-86, 87, and 88 system as strontium oxide. And in fact, Lib's analysis based on isotopic shifts in molecular emission can be widely used for the light elements uh, below about 40 Daltons. And Rick shows in other papers its application even to carbon-12, carbon-13 analysis. Everybody's looking for uh, the uses of nanoparticles these days. And uh, these uh, people here recently published a paper on decorating samples with carb uh, copper nanoparticles on the surface and then doing LIBS. And they found that because of a local increase in the laser irradiance and the sample interaction at, 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 at the, uh, during the laser ablation event, the increased thermal conductivity and lower breakdown threshold of nanoparticles increased the emission intensity from the substrate by factors of 10 to 100 fold. So here we see an aluminum substrate without the nanoparticles, and here we see after nanoparticle decoration. decoration. You can even apply it to real samples here, and this was a, a Sikode Allen iron meteorite that fell to Russia in 1946. Look here, after it's decorated with copper nanoparticles, a, a signal for iridium present at 24 parts per trillion in this sample could actually be resolved above baseline noise, whereas without the nanoparticles, there was no signal at all. Ultra-sensitive determination of metals can be achieved with LIBS. I mentioned that the typical detection limits were part per million. If you do a little bit of sample processing, as evident in this case where elements in a liquid sample are cathodically plated onto a clean aluminum substrate, dried, and then the substrate is laser ablated, limits of detection for a number of elements below part per billion can be readily achieved. Rick has gone further, and with a recent paper in 2014, he's talked about the complementary information that can be generated by coupling LIBS in an emission mode with LIBS by transporting the ablated material to an ICPMS. Complementary information in the fact that uh, information from elements such as fluorine, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen can be obtained in the emission mode from LIBS not readily available from an ICPMS, and high concentrations of these elements can also be monitored by LIBS in the emission mode, and they're problematic with ICPMS because of recalibration. Let's move now to the next of those instrument development areas, and that is graphite furnace, or ETAAS. The most significant advancement that's occurred in the last 30 years in this area was the introduction by Analytic Yenna of a commercial instrument in 2003 dubbed continuum source graphite furnace or flame atomic absorption. Here, the conventional hollow cathode lamp was replaced by a, a small short arc, high pressure, high intensity xenon arc lamp, which had a tremendous output and very stable in the deep UV region. This was then coupled with a high resolution, uh, a shell grading based emission spectrometer, allowing spectral band passes of below two picometers to be achieved. This allowed atomic line profiles to be resolved. That meant that the traditional Walsh method of atomic absorption, where the resolution was typically resident in the emission line intensity from the hollow cathode lamp, was now transferred back to the spectrometer. The resolution is done by the spectrometer. Before, in the 1960s, when Walsh did his methodology, such spectrometers were not readily available, but they are today. And they allow two things to be done, multi-line monitoring of absorption lines of either the same or of different analytes to be achieved, as shown here and here, or the monitoring of molecular transitions, which I'll show in a moment. Here we see an example that within the spectral bandpass of this instrument, approximately one nanometer in the UV, three different emission lines or absorption lines of nickel have been recorded or are conveniently available. With these emission lines or absorption lines, the absorption line profile strength, the sigma value, is significantly different from line to line. And that means the sensitivity on this line is different from this line and different from this one. And it allows you to construct different calibration curves. So whereas with conventional atomic absorption, when you look at one line, the linear dynamic range may be only two orders or three orders of magnitude, with this approach, we can obtain five orders of magnitude. The same thing can be done by sitting on a single line and working in the wings of the absorption line profile where the absorption coefficient decreases in strength. Here is a surreptitious case where it happened to be that four 
lines, four uh, atomic absorption lines from four different elements fell within the spectral band pass. And I think they are iron, lead, cobalt, and nickel. And by introducing um, solid sampling, in this case 0.15 milligrams of a single wall carbon nanotube, uh, Martin Rossano was able to quantitate these four elements in this material using solid sampling, graphite furnace, continuum source, high resolution atomic absorption. 